أردتم أن تكونوا شابة بين الورى فاختفوا آثار جيل للمعالي سطرا إن أردتم أن تكونوا شابة بين الورى فاختفوا الحمد لله يضع فما حمده جميع خلقه كما يحبه ويرضى اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقلة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا يسر ولا تعسر وتمم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتى سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد فعذا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد First of all, we give all praise and all thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For all the favors and bounties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed on us And we send salat and salam, salutation on our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we begin the fourth session of Al Aqidat al Tahawi, Al Aqidat al Tahawi is translated as the Creed of Imam al Tahawi. And if you look at the definition of creed, creed in the English means a set of principles or a set of beliefs. So the system of beliefs. So when you hear the term Al Aqidah, it means the system of our beliefs. And at tahawi refers to the individual that wrote the Aqeedah, which is Imam at tahawi which we will go into inshallah. But when we look at Aqeedah, many a times we hear the term al Aqeedah, but we should understand from where did this word came from, the roots of the word al Aqeedah. al Aqeedah in Arabic is Alif, Lam, Ain, Qaf, Ya, Dal, Tamar, Buta. So you get al Aqeedah. The root of al aqida is aqida ya'qadu ayn qaf dal. There's a root word, that's what it, it was made up from. So you get aqida ya'qadu aqdan. And that means to tie something. So if you're going to tie a cord or you're going to tie a rope to, to make a knot on something, it is known as aqida ya'qadu aqdan. That is the tie if you're tying something. So that is where this word came from, Aqidah. And Allah has mentioned many times in the Quran. Allah has mentioned this word, Aqidah, a lot of times in the Quran. One of the time Allah has mentioned it is Surah An-Nisa, verse 33, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ أَقَدَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ وَآتُوهُمْ نَصِيبُهُمْ Allah says, and those Aqadah, he used the word Aqadah, from Aqidah. So, وَالَّذِينَ أَقَدَتْ Aqadat is known in, in the Arabic, the, the term that is used, Aqadat, it is, it is third person, feminine, singular. So, Aqadat Aymanakum, those whom your Ayman, your oath has binded you or has bound you. See, so he's using the word binding, your oath has become binding on you because you have made that oath. Allah says, Fa'atuhum nasibuhum, you should give them their share, give them their portion. So use the word aqada, and it refers in that ayat, for example, you made an oath to Allah. Say, oh Allah, if you grant me so and so, I will give so and so, or I will do so and so. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to assist you in whatever you are begging and you're asking and you made the oath about, Allah was to fulfill that. Now it is binding on you. So the word aqida means to tie, so now your oath has become binding like if you have tied a rope. So your oath has become tied onto you that you have to fulfill it. So you have to give what you had made that oath, that pledge about. Another ayat Allah mentions in Surah Al-Ma'idah, in verse 8 and 9. Allah says, لا يؤاخذكم الله باللغو في أيمانكم ولكن يؤاخذكم بما أقدتم الأيمان 
In that ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again about Ayman and about Uts. says, Allah will not take you to task بِاللَّقْوِ fi aymanikum With those oaths that you have done meaninglessly, unintentionally. So if you made an oath but you, were not, you have not intended it, it was just out of seeing. You know sometimes we just say things out of seeing wise and we did not have it in our heart. We did not really intend to do it but we just see it. So Allah says Allah will not take you to task for that. But what will Allah take you to task for? Allah says, وَلَكِنْ يُعَاكِدُكُمْ بِمَا أَقَدْتُمُ ayman. Same aqidah is used again. From aqidah, aqada. So Allah says, but I will take you to task for those things which your oath has, you have done it intentionally. Those oath that you have done intentionally. The translation you will get in the Quran will say intended. Those oaths that you have intended. But the word used is aqidah, aqadtum. And as we mentioned, the, the first ayat is translated as binding or bounded. And aqida rootfully means to tie something. So when Allah says, those oaths which you have done that has become binding on you, but the reason it has become binding on you is because you have intended it. So that's why the translation will have intended. Aqattumul Ayman. Also in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the first ayat, Allah used the term again, but He used it in a different way. The first ayat in Surah Maida, Surah Al Maida goes, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, awfu bil ukud. Same aqida, ukud. O you who believe, awfu bil ukud. Fulfill your ukud. Ukud here does not mean tie-in. Ukud here is translated as contract. Fulfill your contract. But the same term, aqida, you get ukud. Aqadat, aqadtum, now you have ukud. But the word ukud here is translated as contract because when you look at the dealings and you look at a contract, a contract must have a buyer and a seller. If you are going to seal a deal, it must have two individuals. And when you, you, you have this commodity or this item or this contract here, both parties must accept. As we will say, tie the deal or tie the knot. So you have to tie the deal. So that's why the same word is used as ukud for contract. And a very short surah that all of us know, one of the quls. Allah used the same word in one of the quls, Surah Al-Falaq. وَمِن شَرْلٍ نَفَّثَاتِ فِي الْأُقَدْ Aqidah, you get uqad now. وَمِن شَرْلٍ نَفَّثَاتِ فِي الْأُقَدْ Where you say, and I seek refuge, I seek protection in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil of those who blow on nuts. So, uqad means knot. Remember, we say that the original aqidah means to tie, to tie a knot. So, you have uqad, which means a knot. And in Surah, Surah Taha, when the, the, famous, the famous dua, Rabbi Shrahli Sadiru Yasili Amri, Wahlul Uqdatan, Uqdatan there again. And Wallah removed the knot, the knot from my tongue. So, these are different places Allah has used the word aqidah which means to tie or to bind something together. The Arabs, <coughs> they used to use the word al-uqad, which we are talking about that comes from Akira. They used to use the word al-uqad when taratubu ramal min kathrat al-matar. Whenever the, the place has become dampened, has become wet because of a lot of rain. You know, sometimes you, you go outside and after a shower, you see the entire place is wet. When they see the place wet like that, they will say, this is uqad. They will use the term uqad. <coughs> they will use uqad. So there is one term, they will use uqad. The next time, the next usage amongst the Arab in the days, they used to say, al-makanul kathir shajara wa nakhal. That uqad is whenever they have a beautiful garden, a, good, a nice, huge place, and they have a lot of trees and a lot of date palms, they will say that is uqad as well. So these are the terminologies from amongst the Arabs. This is how the Arabs used to use the word uqad. So now let us try to understand what does belief have to do with tying? Because uqad means to tie something. So and the, the word that we use in Islam for our beliefs and our aqidah is al-aqidah come from uqad which means to tie. So the connection between the two is that our aqidah and our belief should be tied to our hearts. When you tie something, when you are going to tie something, what is the reason of tying something so that it does not separate? You are tying up something so that it does not remove from one place to the next, so that it could be stationed. 
So for example, you buy a furniture in the store. You buy a cabinet or you buy a couch set, a sofa set, and you have to transport it from the store to your home. You will not just put it in the back of the vehicle and drive off with it. There's a possibility you'll fall off while it's driving. So what you do, you will tie it. And the reason that you are tying it is so that it does not fall off, it does not separate. It stays stay in the same place you want it to stay until it reaches your home. Korbani is coming up very soon. If we buy our animals, do we, do we let it loose in our yards? No, we, we tie it up. We tie it with a rope. The reason we are tying it up is because we do not want it to loose. We do not want it to get away. So similarly, tying. Akida is when you are going to tie what you believe it in your heart so that it does not separate from your heart. So whatever you believe in has to be tied onto your heart. That is the first thing. And not only tied to your hearts, but it should also be tied onto your limbs. So whatever you believe in, whatever things, whatever is your akir and your belief, that which is in your heart should be also shown on your limbs because it should be tied on both your hands as well as your limbs. So that's why it is it has come from the word ukad, which means to tie. <coughs> now, when we look at the, the first scene from the, the Arabs, as you mentioned, the Arabs used to say, تَرَتَّبُ الرَّمَلْ مِنْ كَثْرَةِ الْمَطَرِ They used to say the, the stones or the earth has become wet because of, a, because of a lot of rain, an abundance of rain. When the rain falls, remember there's a dry season sometimes in Trinidad. And when there's a the dry season and you drive down, all you see is bushfire. Bushfire, you see everything brown, everything dry up. And one day, a little bit of shower was to come. After, after that shower, you were to drive back the second day, you will see everything turn green. Because that rain brings life to the earth, brings life to the, brings life to the trees. So the reason that Arabs used to use Aqidah for, for the plants when a rain has just fell and the, the, the ground has been moistened, because just as how that rain brings life to the earth, your Aqidah is supposed to bring life to your heart and your soul. Just as how the earth is coming to life because of that little rain, similarly your akida and your belief, that belief that you're supposed to have is supposed to, uh, is supposed to bring life to your heart as well as your soul. So that is the connection between the Arab saying and the term akida. The second saying of the Arabs was al makanul al-Kathir al-Shajr al-Nakhl. It is a place when there's a lot of trees and a lot of date palms. When there's a lot of trees, what do we get? We got a lot of produce. We get a lot of fruits. If there's a lot of date palms, definitely after some time, we'll get a lot of dates. If there's a lot of mango trees, after some time, we'll get some mango. So whatever trees you have, you'll get fruits from it. Similarly, your akida is supposed to make your life fruitful, to make your heart and your soul fruitful. So that whatever you believe in should be on your limbs. It should be bringing in, just as how those trees produce a lot of fruits, your limbs should produce a lot of a'malas and a lot of action. That is, uh, that is what akida does to your heart and your soul. So this is the term akida. So when we hear the term akida, we should understand what akida really is about. It is about our beliefs. And many times we, <clears throat> we hear about the five pillars of Islam. And most of us, whilst going to Maktab when we were small, we, we memorized the five pillars of Islam. Iman, Salat, Fasting, Zakat, Hajj. From small growing up, we know the five pillars of Islam. And we, we have heard of the importance of these five pillars of Islam. But pillars cannot stand up without a foundation. There's no one that could build a house without having and put up pillars without putting a foundation. When you want to build a house, what do you have to do? The first thing you have to do, you have to dig trench in. You have to dig the trench around. You have to tie steel. You cannot just dig a trench and just throw some, some gravel in it and say, yes, that's my foundation. You have to make sure you tie your steel properly. You put your steel in and then you cast that. And then after you have finished that foundation, and you cannot do it halfway, halfway. Nobody... Nobody casts a foundation half today and half tomorrow. Because, as we all know, concrete don't, don't join. So whenever you're doing a foundation, you have to do the entire thing one time. That is, that is the foundation. And then when your foundation is set, 
That is when you start to put your pillars. You put the, the five pillars or how many pillars. Even if you're not building a concrete house, and you say you're going to build a wood house, you cannot just put some, some pillars or some posts just like that on the earth. You have, to build, you have to dig some butts. Just below the pillars, you still have to dig some butts and cast it in so that the, the pillars do not bend, do not go wrong, do not sink. One side sink and the other stay up. So like that, we have the pillars, but underneath the pillars is the foundation, and our Akira is the foundation. So our Akira has to be there. If there's no Akira, there's no pillars. If there's no foundation, there's no pillars, there's no house. So our Akira is, our, is the main thing, which is the foundation that should be there. <coughs> so as we, we mentioned, the importance of Akira. Akira is very important in our, in our life because Without this, we have no Islam. Without this, we are not Muslim. Without our Akira being right, we are not Muslim. So for us to be Muslim, for us to be truly accepted by Allah, and this is what makes us different from others, our Akira, our belief. The unbelievers and us, how we are same. If you stand up together, an unbeliever on one side and you on the other side, both of you have ears together. Both of you have eyes. Both of you have nose. You are same. There is even some who would even look exact like you. Some grow beard. Some of the unbelievers will still grow beard. Some will dress similar to you. But sometimes we are different because of our beliefs. Our beliefs is what makes us different. Some will even do actions just like us. There are some sect and some that we consider not to be Muslims. For example, the Shias and the other sect which we will go more into details. They dress exactly like us. Same jubba, same topi. They even go to masjids. They grow beard. So you stand up next to each other, they, you're exactly the same. You cannot tell the difference. But you are different because of your beliefs, what you believe in. So our belief is what makes us different from the other. Makes us different from the other religion, as well makes us different from the other sect that might come about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah al kaf Says, "Kol hal nunabbiyukum bil aqsarin a'mala, aladina dalla sa'yuhum fil hayat dunya, wa hum yahsabuna anhum yuhsinuna sunaa." Allah says in that ayat, He says, "Should I not inform you? Kol hal nunabbiyukum? Should we not inform you of those whom their actions has made them losers?" So Allah is saying, "Should I not tell you of those whom their actions?" So, first thing that we should notice from this ayat is that they are doing a'mals. It's not that they are neglectful and they are not doing any good actions. Allah says, Shall I not tell you of those? There are people who are doing actions, they are praying. They are doing a'mals and they are doing actions, but their actions, they are khosirin. They have wasted their actions. They are not getting any blessings, any thawab, no reward for their actions. Then Allah says, <coughs> الَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Allah says those, they have سَعْيُهُمْ Their sai and their efforts Because they are, no, they, they are not those who are neglectful as we mentioned They are those whom they make, they make a lot of effort, a lot of sacrifice Allah says their sai their, their efforts and their struggles are in vain They are dalla, dalla comes from the word dalal Dalal means misguidance so Allah says, Sa'yuhum, Dalla Sa'yuhum, their sai and their efforts is dull, is misguided. But even though it is misguided, it is not according to Islam. Allah says, Wahum yahsabuna annahum yuhsinuna suna. Allah says, they are thinking that they are doing something good. So their belief is what? Their akira is what I am doing is the right thing. Their akira and their strong belief, and that is why they will not change. Even though their actions are misguided, even though their actions are not conforming to what Allah has mentioned in the Quran, even though their actions are not conforming to what Rasulullah has brought, it is not conforming to what the Sahaba practices. Their belief is different from that, but they think that this is something good. So their belief is corrupted, but because that is their Aqidah, their Aqidah would keep them on that wrong path. And that is why we need to correct our Akira. Because if our Akira is wrong, our actions will definitely be wrong. We'll do things thinking that it is good. We'll do things thinking that it is righteousness. 
We'll do action thinking as you know what, I'm going to get paradise for this. We'll do action thinking, I'm going to get blessings and thawab for this. But yet, because the akira is wrong, the actions is wrong, and you're, instead of getting blessings, you're getting sin. So your akira must be present. You must have uh, akira in your belief. Your belief needs to be correct. <coughs> in the time of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was not a class on akira. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never guided his sahabas and said, you know what? Today I'm going to teach you aqidah, I'm going to teach you your beliefs. There was, not, there, there was not a need for that in his time. Similarly for tafsir, he did not say, you know what? I'm going to have a class on tafsir, or I'm going to have a class on fiqh. That was not done in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Different sahabas will come and they want to know about their beliefs. They will come and they will ask the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was present. And any misconception they had, they had him with them. And by Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being present, he was able to answer all the questions. So no misconception could have been in their mind. So any beliefs they want, if they, they were puzzled with something, they will go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and figure it out. So that's why you'll see there wasn't any kind of sect, different sect in the time of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because each would go back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even the Sahabas, in the generation, the fourth century after the Hijrah, there were no different sect. Because the Sahaba got their teachings directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they who were strong on that belief, they were not let go with that aqidah. They were not, they were not change that belief that they got from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they who will form to that. But in the second year after Hijrah, Second year after the migration, second generation, sorry, after the migration, different sects started to come into Islam. And this sect started to come in from scholars. Scholars started, different scholars started to change up. They will look at a passage, they will look at a sentence, and they would want to give their own explanation. And their own explanation now, it sounds good because they are scholars, they are not a layman. They are not the awam and the ordinary people, they are scholars, so their tongue is sweet. So they are explaining something to the people, bringing in a new version of the Akira, bringing in a new thing. Some of the awam thinking that, yes, this is correct, because this, this, this individual is saying it so good. We know him studying for so many years under such and such sheikh, and we know his ability. So we'll listen to him and the awam started to be confused. The normal people started to be confused. And they could not have differentiated between what was the right Akira anymore from what was the wrong Akira. So in the second generation after the Hijra, there was a need for scholars to come up and started to refute these false claims. Because these claims that they started to make, when you look at the sentences that they're using, it has nothing to do with what they're claiming totally false, but the way how they are put it over, it will sound nice. So the confusion started to occur and started to crop up amongst the ordinary people. The scholars, as soon as they heard it, they knew that this is not right. So they were able to understand that this is wrong, but the ordinary people would not be able to do that. And even to our time today, the same thing happens. Same thing happens even to, in our time. A scholar will come and he sounds nice, and he speak a few, few lines of Arabic, and everybody says, yes, he is a big scholar, and you start to follow him. But even though he, sometimes he, he carries you on the wrong path, things that the Rasul never did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, things that the Sahaba never did, but sometimes because we, we do not have that amount of knowledge to, to go against what he's saying, we say, yes, this is something good. So that was what was happening. So that is when the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah came, came up. And the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah refers to those scholars who started to, to write and started to refute against these different sects that started to come. And one of the sect, in one time the Mu'tazila was one sect, deviated sect. You have the Khawarij, you have the Qurmati, and you have the Shias. All of them started to crept in into the teachings of Islam. And the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah those who started was from the, the four Imams, as we know it, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. So these, these Imams of Fiqh, 
And these Imams, they, they spend their entire life trying to fight and trying to refute these false claims. Many of them, in, at one time for 30 years, 3-0, for 30 years, Basra and Kufa was governed by leaders of the Mu'tazila Mu sect. They were governed by them. And because these governors was from the Mu'tazila, the governors used to try to infiltrate the same teachings to the people. And they used to try to get the scholars to accept the teachings of the Mu'tazila because they are the leaders, they are the governors. And many a times, because the Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, when we read the history of Imam Abu Hanifa, Allah, Imam al Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, you will see many a times they will oppose the governors. They were in front of them, they will oppose them. And because of them opposing these governors who wanted to change the Akira, the governors would persecute them. They were beaten in, in front of, in public. Imam Ahmad bin Ahmad, he was lashed a hundred times in front, of, um, in front of the public. He was jailed, he was in prison. Imam Abu Hanifa, the same thing. Imam Ashafi, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, each and every one, because they did not want to change the Akira. And Akira is something you cannot change. If you change it, you are out from Islam. Very simple. If you go against the teachings set by Allah and His Messenger of the Akira, then you are out of the pillar of Islam. So this is not something that you could flex. It is not something that you could be lenient about. There are certain laws that you could be lenient. But when it comes to your beliefs, you cannot be lenient. Because if you are lenient with it, then you are not Muslim again. If there are certain laws and fiqh, sometimes there, there's leniency in it. But when it comes to Akira, there's no leniency with that. And that they were persecuted a lot. <clears throat> And then after the death of these Imams, the four Imams, as you know, the four Imams of the Madhahibs, there were a time, a generation that came and there were three great scholars that stood up for the same kind of Akira. Because after they, have, they passed away, the, the Akira of the Mu'tazila was still around, was still present amongst the people. So after the, the passing away of these great scholars, they, they, writ, they had written a lot of books which guided the other scholars as well. There were three in three different areas. One which was situated in Persia, one in Iraq, and one in Egypt. These were the three places that three scholars were. The one in Persia was Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. Then the one in Iraq was Abu Hassan Ali bin Ismail al-Ash'ari. And then you have the one in Egypt, which is Abu Jafar al tahawi which is the book that we are going to do, the Aqidah of Imam al tahawi So in these three different places, and they were amongst the same timings. Abu Mansur al maturidi he was following the Hanafi Mazhab. As well as Abu Jafar al tahawi he was following the Hanafi Mazhab. So the two of them, the Aqidah was in line with the Aqidah of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. As for Abu Hassan, Abul Hassan Ali bin Ismail al-Ash'ari, his teachings was in accordance to Imam al-Shafi, rahimallah. But all three of them are, are regarded as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama. We, we accept all three of them because the four Imams, the creed and the aqeed of the four Imams is according to what Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa had left. So in this time, Abul Mansur al-Maturidi, he was from a place in Samarkand which is known as Maturid. So he was from that area, and from that Maturid, that tongue that he was, that is named Maturid, that is where he got his name Maturidi. And this is, this is a custom in the past, that wh wherever you are from, they will call you by that title. It is similarly amongst us. If somebody is from Trinidad, you will say Trinidadian. So-and-so, Zaid, who is a Trinidadian. Somebody from Guyana, you will say Guyanese. Somebody from America, you will say American. Right, like that, they, they, they put that to their name to, to signify where they are from. So similarly, Imam at tahawi when we go just now, you'll see the Tahawi is because of the place that he was living. The place that he was living was known as Taha. So you get Tahawi. So like that. So Imam <coughs> Al-Maturidi, he, he wrote different books. One of the books was Makhallat. He wrote at tawhid as well as Rawaid at dilla so he was based in Persia in Samarkand, and he was refuting the Mu'tazila. 
all his efforts trying to go against the Shias, the Khawarij, the Mu'tazila. And then in Iraq, as you mentioned, there was Abu Hassan Ali bin Ismail al Ash'ari. Many of us, while going through narrations, will hear of a Sahaba by the name of Abu Musa al Ash'ari. From Abu Musa al Ash'ari, he says that Rasulullah said so and so. This individual, he was related to Abu Musa al Ash'ari, the Sahaba. He was the great grandson of Abu Musa al Ash'ari. So his lineage was back to that Sahaba Abu Musa al Ash'ari. And as you mentioned, he was, he was living in Iraq and he was born in 260 AH. At the beginning, this al Ash'ari, his teachings, it is regarded as al Ash'ari. You hear about the Aqidah of al Ash'ari. And similarly for maturity, you hear about the Aqidah of maturity and then the Aqidah of Tahawi. So al Ashari, at the beginning, he was not from amongst the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. His beginning stages of his life, he was from amongst the Mu'tazila. His teacher, one of his, te his, his main teacher was al Jubai. And al Jubai was the, one of the leaders of the Mu'tazila. So his teacher was teaching him the creed and the belief of the Mu'tazila. So he was following that for a, a great portion of his life. He was following that. But many a times there were things would come up. There were issues and there were questions. And when he put it forward to his teacher, al Jubai, who was from the Mu'tazila, he could not have answered. And he started to be puzzled. And after some time, he removed from the Mu'tazila and became from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. One of the questions that he raised once to his teacher, <clears throat> one of the questions, according to the Mu'tazilas, one of the beliefs of the Mu'tazila that makes them not believers, even though they might look as Muslims, is that they believe that it is obligatory on Allah. First thing that it is far compulsory, obligatory on Allah, that Allah has to do what is the best, what is best for his servants. So they, they believe that Allah, it is compulsion in Allah. Allah has no choice there. It is far, it is compulsion in Allah that Allah has to do that which is most beneficial for his servants. So this is, as we know, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we know that this is totally incorrect. Allah is fa'alu lima yurid. Allah does whatever he wants. Allah is not obligatory to do anything. It is not compulsion in Allah to do anything. Allah does whatever he wants. If Allah wants good for somebody, Allah does good for him. If Allah wants somebody to remain on misguidance, Allah will allow him to remain on misguidance. That is Allah's power. Allah has that freedom. But they are saying that it is compulsory. So <clears throat> Al-Ashari, he says to his teacher Al-Jubai once, says, I have a question for you. Al-Jubai said, go ahead, ask me the question. He says, I want to know about three people. This, these, three people, they, these three people, they passed away. One is a Muslim, a, a man who is very righteous. He was doing a lot of good deeds. The second is a boy who has not reached the age of maturity. And the third is a, bas, a blasphemer. I want to know what will be their outcome on the day of Yawm al -Qiyama. Where will they go? Will they go to paradise or will they go to, to hell? Will they go to Jahannam? His teacher, who as you mentioned, is from the Mu'tazila tribe, he says, as for the righteous man, the righteous believer, he will go to paradise. He will go in the highest rank of paradise. He says, as for the boy who did not reach the age of puberty, he will go to paradise, but he will be in a lower rank than that of the righteous man. And he says, as for the blasphemer, the blasphemer, he will go in Jahannam. He will go in hell because he died as a sinner. So Al-Ashari, he says to him now, why is it that the boy will be lower than the man, than the righteous man? It, he says, because that man, he did a lot of good deeds. The boy did not reach the age of puberty, so he was not able to do all those good deeds that that, that righteous man did. So Al-Ashari says to him, but it is Allah that caused him not to reach that age. Who caused him to die before he reached the age of puberty? It was Allah. If Allah had allowed him to reach to 40 years or 50 years, he might have done a lot more good deeds than this righteous man. So why is it that he will be in a lower state in Jannah 
and this man will be in a higher stage in Jannah. The, the teacher, Al Jubai, he says to him, Allah will say to that boy, says that Allah will say to that boy that I know that if he would have lived to see so much of years, he would have committed a lot more sins than this, than this sinner. Say, Allah will say that to that boy. So, the <coughs> Al Ashari, he says, All right, now let us look at the blasphemer. He said, Why is it that the blasphemer will go in hell? Al Jubai said he was committing sin. But you remember the, the, the belief of the Mu'tazila is that Allah, it is compulsory in Allah to do what is most beneficial for the servant. That is their creed, that is their belief. So he says, If the blasphemer was to say to Allah, that, oh Allah, it was compulsory on you. It was compulsory on you to make sure that I did not commit that sin. Because it is com the, the belief of the Mu'tazila that Allah's compulsion, Allah's, it is obligatory on Allah that He must not allow the servants to do wrong. So the, the blasphemer could have blamed Allah. Allah is you. It is, it is you who should have stopped me. So when he mentioned this to Al-Jubai, he could not have answered because his belief is it was compulsion on Allah to correct it. But according to us, we know that it is on Allah to do whatever he wants. It is not compulsion for Allah to do anything. Another incident that is mentioned about him that once he had a dream of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And while in this dream, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, O oh, Al-Ashari, you should support Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You should leave out this Mu'tazila because they are misguided. And in this dream, Rasulullah is saying this to him. Leave out the Mu'tazila and follow Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And he says to Rasulullah, how can I do that? Look how many years I've been with the Mu'tazila. Who will support me and will assist me? Who will show me the way? And Rasulullah says to him, if I did not know that Allah would support you and Allah will assist you, I myself would have tell you everything what to do. But I know that Allah will support you and help you, so I will not say anything to you. And it is mentioned that from then on, he, Al-Ashari, he says, many a times I were in gathering, I were in a group of people, and they will bring up these false, deviated views and opinions of, of their Akira. And the, the refuting, the things to refute it would it would just come to my mind just like that. Things that I never thought about before would just come to my mind and I was able to debate with them and refute them. And every time that happened to me, I was always of the opinion that it is Allah that is supporting me because Rasulullah said that Allah will be supporting him. So he would say that that is Allah that is supporting me. It was mentioned that Abdullah bin Khafif, once he said, I'm, I want to go and visit Al-Ash'ari, I want to go and visit Al-Ashari. He went and he, he saw a very handsome sheikh. So he, he says to the sheikh, can you show me where I could find Al-Ashari? And the sheikh tells him, what, why do you want to see Al-Ashari? He says, I just want to meet him. He says, come back tomorrow the same place. You will be able to meet. I'll take you to Al-Ashari. So the man, he comes back the, the next day. He sees the same sheikh and the sheikh leads him to a house. In this house, there were a group of people and they were exchanging views on, on different Akira, views of Akira. And when one says something and the other is questioning and one is answering, as soon as a misguided question or answer comes up, this sheikh that he came with started to refute it, started to debate with them and started to refute and, and explain to them the correct views. And the, this uh, Abdullah bin Khafif, he asked somebody next to him, who is this sheikh that brought me? And then that is refuting all his questions. And it is mentioned that the, the person told him that, that this is Al-Ashari. This is Al-Ashari who you wanted to see, this is Al-Ashari. And when he finished and he was walking back with his Al-Ashari, Al-Ashari asked him, how do you find Al-Ashari? How do you find the sheikh Al-Ashari that you wanted to meet? says, I found him exact the way people talked about him. The same way people were speaking about him, that is the same way I found him. And he asked al Ashri a question, why is it that when you sat with those people, you did not start to inform them of your views? You waited until they started to talk. And al Ashri says, I do not begin a conversation with the infidels. I do not begin conversation with them. 
But whenever they bring up something that is misguided, it is my duty that I must refute it. I must debate with them and I must correct it. That is why when they started to do the question and answering, I was there to refute what they were saying. And as mentioned on, on a Friday, for Juma Salat, on the pulpit, Al-Ashari, he stood up on the member and he told everyone, he announced everyone, all of you, you know who I am. I'm Al-Ashari. And from today, you know that I believe I was following the creed of the Mu'tazila. But from today, I denounce all the beliefs of the Mu'tazila. And he mentioned all the different beliefs that he used to believe in. And he says, I've denounced all of them and I follow the Sunnah of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the creed and the Aqidah of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So we had Abu Mansur al Maturidi from Persia. Then here, Al Ashari, we have him from Iraq doing the same thing, refuting the Mu'tazila, the Shia, the Khawarij. And in Egypt, we have Imam Abu Jafar al Tahawi, which is the book that we'll be doing. Imam Abu Jafar al Tahawi was born in 11th of Rabi al Awal, 239 AH. He was, he was from a tongue by the name of Toha. And that's why we have Tahawi. Tahawi means the individual from Toha. And Toha was a village in Upper Egypt. He was from a family, his mother as well as his father was, was very learned, was scholars. So he, from a very young age, his mother as well as his father would teach him hadith, they would teach him Quran. And like that, he was not only somebody good in Aqidah, but also he was a muhaddis. Just as how Imam al-Bukhari was a muhaddis, Imam Muslim a muhaddis, um, Imam Abu Jafar al-Tahawi, he was also a muhaddis. And he have his own book of hadith as well. Just as how you have Sahih al-Bukhari, you have as well a book by the name of Athar, as well as um, Ma'ani al-Athar by Imam al-Tahawi as well. A, a few volumes of the book of Imam al-Tahawi and hadith. He also his maternal uncle, maternal uncle, which is referred to his mother's brother. His mother's brother was Ismail bin Yahya al-Muzani. Al-Muzani was one of his teachers as well, which was his own uncle. And Al-Muzani was one of the favorite student of Imam al-Shafi. Imam al-Tahawi, his mother and father was also following the Shafi mazhab. So his mother and father, Shafi, as well as his teacher that he has now, which is Al-Muzani, he was also a favorite student of Imam al-Shafi, so all the teachings he was getting was according to the Shafi mazhab. So the beginning of his life, he was following the, the mazhab of Imam al-Shafi. And many a times he would put forward questions to, to Imam al-Muzani. He would ask him certain questions, and he realized that Imam al-Muzani, he, he cannot answer those questions. Certain things he cannot answer. And he realized that he was used, his teacher al-Muzani, who was a Shafi and a favorite student of Imam al-Shafi, he would go to the books of Imam Abu Hanifa to, learn, to, to get answers for certain things. So when Imam Abu Jafar Tahawi saw that, he himself started to look in the books of Imam Abu Hanifa. And while going through the books of Imam Abu Hanifa, he started to get to like the Hanifi mazhab. He liked the, the way how Imam Abu Hanifa would answer and the, with the kind of logics and the kind of dalil that Imam Abu Hanifa would put forward. As well in Egypt, the governor was from the Shafi mazhab. And when that governor was removed, the other governor that came was from amongst the Hanifi mazhab. So the other was from the Hanifi mazhab and he started to go to this, to this Hanafi governor, and he, the, the, sorry, the Hanafi judge, and he started to learn from him, and he started to be engrossed in a Hanafi mazhab, so from then on, he, was, he changed his mazhab towards the Hanafi mazhab. So from then on, he was following the Hanafi mazhab. He wrote, as we mentioned, he wrote books in fiqh, he wrote books in hadith, and the most famous is the Aqidat al-Tahawi he wrote as well. When Imam Bukhari passed away, when Imam Bukhari passed away, Imam Abu Jafar Tahawi, he was only 17 years old. When Imam Muslim, who wrote the, the Muslim Sharif, Imam Muslim passed away, he was 23 years old. When Imam Abu Dawood passed away, he was 36 years old. 
When Imam An Nasai passed away, he was 64 years old. So he was very old at the time Imam An Nasai passed away. When Imam Ibn Majah passed away, he was 34 years old. When Imam Tirmizi passed away, he was 40 years old. When Imam Ahmad passed away, he was two years old. And as we know, for the four mazhab, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal was the last. So when Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal passed away, he was only two years old. When Imam Ad-Darimi passed away, he was 16 years old. And when Ibn Khuzayma passed away, he was 72 years old. So he was around all the muhaddis, the time of the muhaddithin. And he memorized many, many hadiths, a large number of hadiths. And when we looked at his book, Ma'ani al-Athar, the, the way, the system of how he has placed those hadiths, he has placed it in the system of fiqh. So for example, you want to know laws of fiqh, he has placed the hadith on each law of fiqh. So when you want the support, you want the dalil of why is it that you're doing this in fiqh, you have the hadith to support it. And that is why he has, his book is well known for that. He had many good teachers, great teachers amongst. He had many students. <clears throat> as well as, as we mentioned, this book that we're going to do, al Aqida to Tahawi. This is one of the Aqidah book that is being taught around the world. All the schools you think about, all the great madaris, all the great Darul Ulums, they will teach this book, al Aqidah to Tahawi. Be it if those schools are following the Shafi Mazhab, be it if those schools are following the Maliki Mazhab, the Hanafi Mazhab, the Hanbali Mazhab, even among the Salafia would use the Aqidah of Imam at tahawi So it is accepted by all, the Aqidah. And it's a very small book. You see the original book, it is a very small book. But when you look at the way how he has put forward it, the way how he has put it down and he has explained it, it is great and is acceptable by all. So inshallah, from next week, we'll be doing, we'll actually start the book. This is just an introduction of the topic that we're going to do of Akira Tatahawi. So next week, inshallah, we'll do it. We'll start from the, the first page and we'll see, try to complete the entire book, inshallah. So I hope that everyone will come out. As we know, in the time of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he went to the people, the people were idol worshippers. What were their beliefs? They believed that these idols will save me. These idols will help me to go to paradise. These idols will, will save me from the fire. These idols will do everything for me. These idols will bring food for me. These idols will bring drink for me. That was their Akira. And when he went to them, what did he change? He did not change their actions. They were fornicators. They were gamblers. They were, they were murderers. They were all kind of things. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa went to them, he did not say, stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing that. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them their aqidah, taught them their belief, what you need to believe in. And when he taught them their aqidah and their belief, they were ready to give their lives up for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were ready to give up anything because their aqidah was right, their beliefs was corrected. So like that, as long as we correct our beliefs and we correct our aqidah, as long as that is corrected, you will see our actions will be correct as well. Even in our time, we see many a times we put on the news and we look, uh, for example, in the, the month of Muharram, you will see the tent of Muharram, you see Ashur, you see people beating up themselves, cutting up themselves, doing a, a lot of madness. Even when, when you look at the news, you will see suicide bombers, this one bombing down here, you will see this one claiming that we have to fight jihad. These people are doing those things because their aqidah is not right. If your aqidah is correct and your belief in cor is correct, then you will know that that is wrong to do. Your actions will not want to do that because your aqidah is, is different from what you want to go and do. So the first thing we need to correct, for our limbs to do that which is right, our aqidah, our beliefs, which is in our hearts, has to be correct for us. If that is not correct, then definitely from the beginning and I'm focusing on this, if our aqidah is not right, our actions will not be correct. And this is what makes a difference. So we need to know and we need to understand our aqidah. So inshallah with this we close. Next week inshallah we'll continue. We'll start the book Al-Aqidah to Tahawi. I hope that brothers will continue to come out inshallah and also invite others as well so that we have a larger class inshallah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. 
Subhanakallahumma bihamdik Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta Nastagfirka wa natubi ilaik Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In aradtum an takunu shamatan bayna al-wara Faqtafu atha rajeelin lil ma'ali sattara In aradtum an takunu shamatan bayna al-wara Faqtafu atha rajeelin lil ma'ali sattara Jeel zaydin wa usaydin wa mu'adin wal-wara